Ivan Boski, Michael Milton, Milken, Martin Siegel, all names from the 1980s, all pleaded guilty to charges of insider trading. Nearly a quarter of a century later, has anything changed? Bruce Baird worked on the Boski era insider trading cases as a young assistant U.S. attorney here in Manhattan. He's now a partner at Covington and Burling in Washington, and he joins us on the phone. Mr. Baird, welcome to Bottom Line. Thanks for having me. Sir, unlike the 80s, the financial world's now global, and because of technology, CEOs and top managers aren't the only ones with access to privileged information. Is this now an era of insider trading, I guess you could say, on steroids? <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Uh, information is money. The more global the uh, markets are, the more global the economy is, the more global financial firms are, uh, the more uh, profitable information can be if no one else has it. There are so many more hedge funds today than there were 10, 15, even 20 years ago. And with so much pressure to produce top returns, is the temptation greater to cut corners? Well, I, I think the temptation is always there. Uh, financial firms are in a world in which information is money, and the temptation will be there, I think, as long as uh, people are human. Uh in 2011, people in business and finance, as you just alluded to, have access to hundreds of sources, and some of those sources are legitimate, and some of, their, some of them aren't. Here's a question I've been asking my prior two guests. How do you make the distinction between what is research and what is privileged information? Roger Rotnam's lawyers insisted his trades were the result of research, including analyst reports, news accounts, and stock trading trends. Well, when you have tapes, it's, it's not hard to uh, figure out which is which. You're not researching if you're getting the information from someone. The, the uh, problem in these cases is always what's the intent of the person, uh, what, what was intent. And if you have a tape, it's easy to figure out what the intent was. If you don't have a tape, uh, and that's, of course, where most cases are, right. it's much harder to prove intent. And, and, and in one of those tapes, there was a wiretap conversation and Roger Rotnam uh, talking about Goldman Sachs earnings in October of 08. And we have it. We want to put it on the screen for our viewers. It says, I heard yesterday from somebody who's on the board of Goldman Sachs that they're going to lose $2 per share. The street has them making two fifty. With information like that on tape, is that just too damning uh, evidence for the jury to ignore? Yes, I think that's right. Um, there's a question whether prosecutors are being uh, over aggressive in these cases, whether they're uh, using resources for a case like this that might be better spent on something that didn't used to be criminal at all. Right. Uh, but, uh, but certainly when you have tapes, when you have out of someone's own mouth, a jury can uh, listen to what's being said and draw right. their own conclusions. Mr. Baird, I have about 30 seconds left. I mentioned in the open that you were a young assistant U.S. attorney during the Boski era insider trading cases. Any similarities that you thought of when you heard about today's verdict? Sure. Uh, human motive, uh, human desire for money and, and power and status. Um, the means are different, uh, but... Uh, but the end is the same. Bruce Baird, he is a partner at Covington and Burling in Washington, joining us on the phone. Mr. Baird, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir.